Hi, I'm Chike Coleman of Sound on Sight and Smile Politely. That's Chuck Kaplinski of the Illinois Times from Springfield and the News Gazette. Uh, this is the Real Review Cinematic Underground, uh, and this is the show where we talk about movies we've seen this week. Chuck, it's been a long time since we've done a show. Uh, it's only been a couple weeks. It's been three weeks or so. Oh, but we've had worse yeah, droughts. We, we've had worse droughts in like a month where we didn't yeah. do a show, so yeah. I mean... I guess that's part of the course. Um, this week, I saw two films, and I want to open up with a discussion on the first, which is Godzilla. Godzilla! Yes. Okay. Uh, the 2014 remake directed by Gareth Edwards, um, who also directed a film named Monsters not too long ago. And I just read yesterday or today that he has just been named a Direct something else, which sounded interesting too. I'll try the and find Star it. The Star Wars spinoff. The Star Wars spinoff. That's correct. What is the Star Wars spinoff? Uh, Do we I'm know yet, or is I'm it clouded in secrecy? I, I'm assuming that they're referring to the first of two, which is going to be involving Boba Fett. Aha! Uh -huh. Oh, that'll be fun. So, um, yeah, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to say that because of the money he made in the opening weekend for Godzilla, that was automatically his. Mm -hmm. Uh, and seeing that he knows how to do monsters and could do a good Boba Fett creature feature where Boba Fett's hunting creatures or people, I think it would be a good intense but kind I, of thriller I, type of thing. I wonder then if that knocks him out of Godzilla 2 because I know they're already planning a Godzilla 2. I would say he would do Godzilla 2 before doing Boba Fett because that Star Wars episode 7 is so far down the pipeline. So Boba Fett will be after this other Star Wars. Correct. Yeah. I see. Okay, mm -hmm. well, yeah, I guess there'll, there'll be time. Th there'll be time. Um... So Godzilla, starring Brian Cranston, Aaron Taylor Johnson, uh, Juliet Binoche, uh, Elizabeth Olsen, and uh, Ken Watanabe, I believe that's how you say his last mm -hmm. name, um, it tells the story of how uh, Godzilla uh, is basically this protector and overlord of the world, and he... His job is to make sure that things are in balance. Yeah, in balance. As, as uh, we have been... Ex as it's, we've been told. Yeah, over what, the last 17 movies of Godzilla? Uh, there have actually been, and I didn't realize this, uh, the Chicago Tribune, uh, when the film was released, they did a ranking of all 30. 30 I had no Godzilla idea movies. there were 30 Godzilla movies, yeah. Okay. So, so I guess the last 29, because the first one, he is definitely mm -hmm. the bad guy. Yeah, definitely. Um, the, the thing that I really love about this is that Godzilla is the protector. Um, they have two motos. Mutos, Mutos, Mutos yes. which are, I forget what the acronym was? Uh, something unidentified, unidentified terrestrial object. Yeah. Something, yes. Yeah. So um, he has to fight two Motos uh, of, of varying size and uh, similar shape. Uh, and uh, Aaron Taylor Johnson is basically his human counterpart. We should uh, mention something very specific. That all of this Godzilla stuff takes place from the human perspective mm -hmm. up until about the last 10 minutes of the film. Oh, I'd say about the last half hour. No, no, you can't really say that. Cause I can say that. I just th said it. They give you The words just came out of my mouth. <laughs> yes, but my point is they give you glimpses of things from the monster's point of view and from Godzilla's point of view. They don't let you actually hold on it until the last 10 minutes. Oh, you. okay, if you say so. Um, Brian Cranston plays a scientist who suffers an incredible loss at the very beginning of the film. Uh, uh, and um, Aaron Taylor Johnson plays his son, a lieutenant in a bomb squad for what I believe is the Navy. Yeah. It's either the Navy or the Marines. I'm sorry if I'm By the time the Godzilla gets done, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, so this movie, I, I saw the original Kojila, uh, and I think um, that the film pays confident and successful homage to the first film. Uh, there's not a lot of fear uh, in terms of, you know, being destroyed as much as there was in the first film ages ago. I forget what year that came out. 1954. 1954. 60 years. But, um, but I liked it overall. I thought it was really great to go from the human being's perspective. I mean, they tried to do that with the Godzilla That Doesn't Exist, 1998 Godzilla, directed by Roland Emmerich. But I think it worked much better here because you got a little of the panic and the pandemonium of 
oh crap, Godzilla can destroy us all or these monsters can destroy us all. Chuck, what did you think of the 2014 Godzilla? I really liked it a lot. Um, he uh, took a page from the uh, Steven Spielberg Jaws handbook. Uh, yes. Not showing the monster for a long, long time. I mean, and I Jurassic Park as well. I think uh, we go about an hour uh, before we actually see Godzilla completely. I mean, up until that point, we see his tail, maybe, and his foot. And, uh, and maybe when he some scales sticking out of the back of his, you know, body. Uh, but, um, and, and I think that's a good way of building suspense with the film. Because uh, when he does finally make his appearance and we hear that, uh, that scream, uh, which we've become, has become synonymous with him, I mean, it really does have a good effect. Yeah. Um, and I like how they, they go back and they tie in a lot of the Godzilla history, but also um, atomic age history, I guess I would say. Apparently those Pacific um, tests on atomic bombs in the 50s were not, in fact, tests, according to the film. They were, in, in fact, efforts to kill or contain Godzilla, uh, which I think is neat whenever they go back and try and give us another aspect of history, you know, give mm -hmm. us the real version, as it were. Uh, and the effects are just dynamite. Uh, they, really are. they really are, are, are. And again, that whole point of shooting from our perspective reinstills the fear of this creature. Right. Uh, two images that stick with me. There's one at the airport uh, in which we see one of the Mutos destroying a bunch of planes, and then all we see is Godzilla's foot step in, mm -hmm. and we see that through the you know, the huge glass windows that you have mm -hmm. in an airport. And we see some of the destruction, but we don't see the complete monster. And that's a good mm -hmm. way of showing the scale of these things, how small we are in comparison to, you know, them. And then there's another wonderful brief glimpse in, in which Elizabeth Olsen is going into a fallout shelter of the subway. Yeah. And they're closing the door behind her, and you can see Godzilla. Mm -hmm. and, just, and, the oh, and then the door closes. The right, yeah. uh, so that's neat. It gives you just enough. Uh, and then we get the, you know, the ending, the climax, in which we get it all. And uh, great use of the atomic breath, by the way, Godzilla, especially on that last one. Oh, that was, yeah, uh, I was going to talk to you about that, that one. That was inspired. Bit, that bit next. Um, I think the strongest performer in this film, other than Godzilla himself, is Brian Cranston. You didn't think he was a little too much? Uh, well, in his elderly stage, yes. Okay. But in the beginning, that scene was like Star Trek. Uh, the remake, Star Trek, just mm -hmm. broke my heart in half. Mm -hmm. Even though we've seen that type of thing hundreds of times before, somehow the way they shot that mm -hmm. and the way the communication was made it feel completely different and original than what I'd seen before when mm -hmm. that type of scene played out. And it was Julia Benoche. It was. Which it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I also, I, I like Ken Watanabe here too. I mean, he has the unenviable job of explaining everything. Explaining everything Which and also being this much man in the room, like you don't want to do what you're doing. The arrogance of human man and uh, nature and the idea of kind of the arrogance of man thinking they can control nature, I believe it was. Yep, that would be it. A and that was a great I way to spin that too for me. I thought that that was really well played. And you got to see it play out with you know how Godzilla reacts to human beings toward the end of the film. Now, let's talk about what everybody cares about, the fights. Uh, though it was hard to see in the dark in terms of, you know, who was getting what punches landed, I thought that those fights were still spectacular. Did they beat uh, Pacific Rim? I don't think so. Um, but, but they're I, still really good. Uh, but I think Pacific Rim's fights were darker. True. I mean, and there was a lot of rain and a lot of darkness in that. Um, but there were far more in Pacific Rim as well. Exactly. Uh, and I think, it, this may sound silly, but I think there was even more of a grander scale to Pacific Rim. I agree. Uh, but still, this is, you know, still, it's Godzilla is well done. I don't want to say it, say it isn't. Uh, I just, I did prefer Pacific Rim a bit more. And I have to say, the, the thing that made me want to cheer the loudest was when he, uh, Godzilla, I mean, was getting well the the human character that we've been following was getting ready to die at the hands of the moto and all of a sudden right as he's about to get to him godzilla stops him grabs him and then does atomic breath right down his throat and then takes his head off and does what i like to call the rapper's mic drop with the moto's head <laughs> and i was just like yep 
<laughs> yep, that's what I wanted to happen. That's what I needed to happen. Uh, and that just made me be on board for a sequel. I don't care if I have to wait an hour and a half to see Godzilla take somebody down. As long as it gets taken down in a way that's kind of epic that you don't expect. Did you find the ending rather abrupt? Oh, yeah. It was very, yeah, I mean, once he, that happens, we're Once he wakes up done. and he just walks away, it's just like, <laughs> over. And I'm just like, really? You're not going to give us any hint of where we, we could go next or what human beings could feel like other than that Godzilla is our savior? Okay, great. Um, I gave this movie, when I, when I reviewed it, a three and a half out of four stars. What did you give it? It's the same. I, I think it's a very complexly well-made film in terms of you know, how they decided to shoot everything, but the human characters other than Brian Cranston really don't work for me. Uh, did you find the same with Elizabeth Olsen? I wanted to ask that. I like her a lot. I think she was fine. They just didn't give her enough to do. I agree. Um, the second film that I saw this week uh, came out on Thursday, and that's X-Men Days of Future Past. Have you seen it, John? Yep, I have. Okay, do you want to give the audience a little plot? No, nope, you good, good luck with I that. I did the first one. Well, well, you, but that was easy compared to this, so go ahead. Fine. Besides, you like to talk. In a distant future, uh, Wolverine... Professor X, uh, Bishop, Iceman, and Kitty Pride, aka Shadowcat. Don't forget Storm. And Storm are fighting for their lives in distant Moscow and China. They realize that Kitty Pride has the ability to take someone's mental consciousness back uh, a few days so that they can be informed of when attacks are coming. They all die, but then Kitty Pride takes one person's mind back a few days so that that person can, can warn the previous selves of the incoming attack by these things called sentinels who are trained to hunt mutants. The reason these mutants are hunt or the, the reason these sentinels are hunting mutants is because they've been programmed that way by a man named Dr. Trask. Uh, Trask does not like mutants in the least sense. And what Kitty Pride decides to do is, uh, from the uh, stories that uh, Professor X and Magneto, who is now part of the banding party, uh, tell her, this all started because uh, Raven, AKA Mystique, decided to shoot and kill Trask, and that made the government antsy about the fact that there were mutant be uh, species out there and that because this mutant decided to do a violent act, that they needed to install his sentinel program as kind of a memoriam and as a safeguard against mutants. And so for the next 50 years, they perfect those sentinels to be the best by capturing Mystique and using her DNA to build mutating, faster, stronger sentinels that can hunt down and kill any mutant. Uh, they decide... As well hmm. as... Any humans as well as who any have humans. DNA they think can breed a mutant. Agree, right? Um, and so, Kitty Pride decides that the only well, actually no, Professor X decides that the only way that Kitty Pride can help stop this catastrophe is that if someone goes back in time, Charles Xavier initially volunteers for the mind-bending trip back to the most farthest past you can go, which to them is 1972, uh, to stop this event. Uh, but then he realizes my mind cannot handle the journey. And then Wolverine says, what if somebody's mind could heal while taking the journey? And Professor X says, fine, you go. And from there, Wolverine goes back into the past to find Professor X, uh, make him hope again, uh, and have him work with Magneto to stop Raven slash Mystique from killing Trask. Now you say what you thought of the film, because I just did that without... I'm exhausted just while I'm listening to you. I can't. <laughs> uh, it's not a movie you can go get popcorn during, uh, mm. or go to the bathroom. You've got to take care of that stuff before the movie starts, because uh, it is that complex, and it moves uh, very quickly, I thought. Um, a very smart movie uh, in many ways, uh, and I think that's what distinguishes the X-Men films from the other superhero films, is that it's smart... And it has a conscience. It still is very much about um, prejudice, about being alienated, about uh, ethnic cleansing, basically. Uh, or else, I guess you could say, genetic cleansing in this, in this case. 
Um, it was good to see everybody at the back. It was good to see the old and the young interact with each other. I thought that was pretty neat. Mm -hmm. um, I think the film's a bit long. I think it kind of overplays its hand I a little disagree. bit. Uh, I think it's a bit too clever for its own good at times. Um, but I, the one thing I liked about it is that it tied up a lot of plot strands that have been dangling in the last four films. And it even ties in things you didn't realize needed to be tied up. Well, I'll give an example. Uh, at the end with Wolverine when he is found, I guess. Oh, yeah. Uh, that, 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 was, that was an interesting turn of events, that, yeah. that last little bit. I was like, wait, what? Uh, you know, that alludes to something that you didn't think needed more explanation, but then there it is. Um, and also, characters who are supposedly dead, and of course we know that in comic books or comic movies, no one's ever really dead. Mm. Uh, even they pop up very nicely as well. Oh yeah, there's, um, there's a personal favorite I have that we'll talk about after the show's over. Um, and I don't know if that means then that they will be back for the next one. Does this mean that everything has been reset back to zero? Uh, I'm not sure. I know that the next X-Men movie has already been planned uh, for 2016. It's in the 1980s. Uh, it's called X-Men Apocalypse, and I believe that if you sit through all the credits of uh, X-Men Days of You'll Future Past, why that tells you, you will see uh, a little hint as to what's going on. Yeah. Um, I was baffled by the things that happened in this movie. First off, I want to make a very clear statement. This film is not directed by Brett Ratner. This film was directed by Brian Singer, the director of the first two X-Men films. So if you love the first two X-Men films and you didn't like or don't think that the third one exists, go see this one. You're going to love it. Um, but you should have seen the first two. Yeah, you and, should have. And uh, first class. Yeah. Uh, you do need to have some background or else you will be completely lost. Yeah. I would say that the crowning achievement of this film is the idea that you have both casts working together, mm -hmm. uh, and they do it in a seamless way that doesn't push anybody out of the circle uh, of, of trying to do what they need to do to keep things going. The, uh, there's um, so much I could say about this film. What I, I want to spotlight my favorite moment in the film. I have two favorite moments, though. None of them really pertain to the plot. They're just fun little sides. Uh, I have a moment in that film which is the most fun I've had in a movie this year. You go first because I think we have the same it's moment. It's got to be the Quicksilver yep, moment. Yep, there we go. The, the neatest new character. Yeah, uh, really just seriously the best character you possibly have. They, one of the smart things they do and what you need to do, and any, any performer needs to do, is leave you wanting more. And yeah. you definitely want more of this character. Uh, the Quicksilver character uh, is super, super fast. Um, and it's a neat little joke, too, that a lot of people might not catch. Oh, yeah. That uh, was a great but thing. He uh, is significant because also, if you saw the last uh, Captain America film, that character does appear after one of the credit sequences, and he will be involved in the next Avengers movie. You know who's play playing him? Aaron Taylor Johnson. Oh. Uh, he is going to be the only character that is going to straddle those two franchises. Uh, because of rights issues, but we don't even want to get into that because that will take up all of our time. Yeah, that's mucky. But the sequence uh, at Magneto, they find, is locked up in the basement of the Pentagon. Who knew the Pentagon had a basement with a prison in it? Uh, mm -hmm. And they go in to break him out, and Quicksilver is the secret weapon. And they do a neat thing in which uh, they are about to get shot. Um, bullets are fired. And then Quicksilver goes into action. And as he's running super fast, we see everything from his point of view, which is super slow and, and super the water hilarious. is flying uh, bullets are flying but everything's moving really slow and he's able to adjust a lot of different things so that they can get out of there safely it's almost like an old tex avery moment from an old tex avery cartoon just it's the way so they have exaggerated guards punching each other yeah 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 it, that was just so much fun it was just so great mm -hmm. um the other thing that I think is great is that they, they, they basically retcon most of X-Men The Last Stand. They just say, oh, yeah, that would have happened if this hadn't happened. And I love that because I'm one of those people who really hated X-Men The Last Stand. I, th I was really absolutely beyond overjoyed that um, you had Wolverine being the 
a-hole that he is supposed to be in the comics. Like when Professor Xavier meets Wolverine, uh, they have this conversation. He's like, I, say I believe you, even if I do believe you, I really don't trust you. And because of that, I'm going to say exactly what you said to me when I asked for your help 10 years ago, which was, you know, mm -hmm. F off. Mm -hmm. And I thought that's a great tie-in. Oh, I should mention that Professor Xavier is no longer a professor at the start of this film, and that he walks. And the explanation behind that is kind of brilliant. But it also leaves more questions in the air, like why, if, if the thing that Professor Xavier uses exists, why don't, um, why is it not used with other uh, characters in that universe? Uh, I really had fun with this movie. I really felt sad at different points in this movie, especially if you're thinking about the beginning. The horde ways that the Sentinels capture people. And I think the, the, the death uh, that occurs that turned out to me to be the most grotesque is the one where they pull apart the metal guy. Mm -hmm. uh, Colossus. Colossus. They pull apart <laughs> Colossus, and I'm just like, oh! That sucks. But, isn't he still alive? He is. By the end. And Ellen Page gives a very subtle... Centenary performance. <laughs> what was it? Centenary? Yeah. Stationary. Still. Yeah, a very still, <laughs> simple performance. Uh, Ian McKellen doesn't get much to do except for at the end. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Neither does Patrick Stewart except being the voice of reason giving the most wonderful monologues of all time. Uh, and it's, Fassbender is cool. He's very neat. Uh, I know that they were, um, I would love to him, I know it'll never happen, but I can see him very much as Batman as well. Uh, yeah, I'll he, he do could that. pull off both, both Bruce Wayne and Batman. I think he has that bearing. Yeah, I would agree with you there. My problem with Magneto is I hated him even more than I did the first time around. Oh, really? Yeah, I can still understand him. <sighs> and I love the reason as to why he's locked up. In the Pentagon. I, I thought that was cool. My question is, uh, not to spoil it for our, our, our uh, watchers here, but um, what power did the person he was trying to save have? Yeah, that uh, does remain unanswered. That's my big question. Yeah. I'm just like, mm, yeah. I'm curious now. Extreme good looks and charisma. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that would be a power. Maybe he, maybe he, uh, that person was a shapeshifter as well. Who knows? That yeah. would make complete sense. Um, uh, one last thing I want to say about this franchise is I've always thought it was a wonderful metaphor for uh, the civil rights movement in terms of Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X. I've always thought that Professor X was uh, Martin Luther King Jr. and that Magneto was Malcolm X. Uh, and those two different I ideologies continue to clash throughout this franchise. Uh, and I really love the way that that kind of, that X-Men has shaped or did shape that debate when it came out. Mm -hmm. I don't remember what year the comic began, do you? Uh, 62, 63. So still at the very burgeoning of that movement, you know, when it was getting ready to go to its height. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, I really love that nice little parallel there that, that Stan Lee either chose to create or just happened upon. Mm -hmm. uh, either way, that makes Stan Lee one of the most forward-thinking men of our time. Uh, I, I love this movie a lot. Uh, is it going to hold up the test of time? I don't know, but it's certainly going to surpass X-Men <laughs> The Last Stand. Uh, is there anything else you want to say about the movie? No. All right. Um, we have a few minutes left. Uh, did you want to discuss that thing we didn't get to talk about uh, uh, with the enemy last week? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> well, <laughs> we don't have a lot of time. We, we have enough for me to say a couple things. Uh, enemy, the end of the film, what we didn't really get to talk about is at the end of the film, the lead character's uh, girlfriend or wife, I forget who we're at now, which one that was, mm. is a giant spider. And the giant spider, like, curls away in defeat. And there's a lot of amazing little metaphors about how um, Jake Joan Hall's character is kind of the thing the spider would be afraid of. Uh, not in terms of uh, Jake Joan Hall's commitment issues in, in terms of his relationships, but just in the fear that he will go back to the bad life he was in. And I really love that about Enemy. 
and the metaphors that were used in terms of the spider uh, and the club that he was in and the key, that makes it a very powerful and strong movie, and I think it's one everybody needs to see. Um, keeping on superheroes for just a minute, uh, I am not excited to see the new Flash TV series. I think it's going to be a waste of time. I am, however, excited for Arrow, and you do need to catch up on that this summer, Chuck, because I want to talk about that show with you. Okay. Um, what's coming up next week that you're excited for? Um, Million Ways to Die in the West and then Maleficent are coming out. Um, not a big fan of the uh, McFarlane, but I have to say the previews to this comedy look funny. You uh, did they say do you look liked funny. Ted, though. And that did surprise me. That I, I will admit that I like that, and that did surprise me. Uh, I'm looking forward to in two weeks the Tom Cruise film, Edge of Tomorrow. Edge of Tomorrow looks interesting. Very I don't know if it'll hold water, though. Uh, I'm curious about Maleficent in the sense that it's the take of them making a bad character good. It looks to me too much like Snow White and the Huntsman. I Visually, didn't, I didn't uh, see Snow White and the Huntsman. You, know, you won't have to if you see Maleficent. <laughs> I, f I feel like this is where the plot of Maleficent is going. Correct me if I'm wrong. Maleficent's a good person. She actually ended up putting the spire uh, on the child's finger to protect her from her father and give herself time to kill the king. Because well, the king know. actually took her wings and devalued what she stood for. We'll have to wait and see. That's my guess. If I'm right, great. Um, so, until next time, I'm Chike Coleman of Sound On Sight and Smile Politely, and that's Chuck Plenty of the Illinois Times and News Gazette. We will see you later.